Suck, Chooms. How y'all living? Hope everybody gets Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, one of the most common questions I get about finasteride is whether or not it is safe to take it if you're trying to have a baby with your partner. Well, first of all, the good news is that because you have hair, you'll actually have a partner who will want to breed with you to begin with. So that's another reason to be thankful for finasteride. Of course, when you are passing on your genes to future generations, you don't want there to be any complications and have your baby grow up to be Jason Blaha. So, Hair loss witchers, they need assurance that their progeny will be safe while they fight the slaphead curse. So, the first question that is often asked is whether finasteride affects male fertility. I already did a video on that, which I'll link below, so that's not going to be the main focus of this video, but I will briefly summarize the data on fertility here. So. There was a double-blind randomized controlled study on the effect of finasteride on sperm function back in 1999. The results of this study were reassuring because there was no effect from finasteride that was found on sperm production or on sperm function. In some of the subjects, there was a small decrease in ejaculate volume and prostate volume that was reversible upon stopping the drug. The decrease in ejaculate volume was only an 11% decrease, but in the placebo group, the ejaculate also decreased by 8%. So, the absolute difference in ejaculate volume was only 3%. However, the total number of sperm per each ejaculate did not decrease, so you can't consider this to be some form of birth control. So, sometimes you will hear people complain about how finasteride gives them a reduced ejaculatory volume, but it doesn't really matter because finasteride will not stop your partner from conceiving because even if the semen volume is lower, the sperm count is still about the same. Since that study, though, there have been a number of case reports like this one here, which I actually covered in my last video. In the article, a couple was being evaluated for infertility and miscarriages, and the 37-year-old male spouse who was on finasteride at 1 milligram daily was found to have normal semen volume, normal sperm concentration, and normal sperm motility, meaning normal sperm movement. The doctors did find increased sperm DNA fragmentation, which improved upon stopping finasteride. However, there had been no measurement of the sperm DNA fragmentation before starting finasteride, so the case report doesn't show that finasteride was the the cause of the problem. Also, despite stopping finasteride, the couple remained infertile. So whether the DNA fragmentation was the cause of the fertility problem is anyone's guess. It's also possible the woman was the one who was infertile. The authors of the study did recommend that a trial of stopping finasteride would perhaps be useful in infertile men, but that would only be something to be considered in a man who has fertility issues to begin with. So besides case reports like that one, there is a database study published in 2013 that looked at finasteride use in men presenting to a fertility clinic. In this study of 4,400 infertile men, only 27, which is just 0.06%, were on finasteride. These men were advised to stop finasteride, and after being off of finasteride for an average of six months, they had some improvement in their sperm counts and their sperm motility. However, to put this data into perspective, we are only talking about data on 14 men, and we don't know if there were other treatments going on in these men who, after all, were being seen in a fertility clinic for the treatment of low sperm counts. Also, there is a statistical phenomenon called regression towards the mean. What that means is that if you have an extreme low measurement like in these men, then the next measurement is likely to be closer to the average value, which will be higher. What this means is that someone with a low sperm count one day is likely to have a higher sperm count on another day just by chance alone. So that can give a false impression of a treatment effect even when there really isn't a treatment effect at all. So the authors of this study also conclude that an infertile or sub subfertile men on finasteride, it would be worth giving it a trial of temporary discontinuation. The study doesn't tell us anything about the incidence of fertility problems with finasteride, and it doesn't imply that men with normal fertility are likely to lose their fertility as a consequence of taking finasteride. Fortunately, there is one more important study, this time another randomized controlled study, specifically this one here. In the study, 99 men were randomized to receive either dutasteride at 0.5 mg per day, finasteride at 5 mg per day, or a placebo. Blood and semen samples were collected at baseline, and after 6 and 12 months of treatment, as well as 6 months after treatment was stopped. As you would expect, serum DHT levels dropped with the 5AR blockers, and serum testosterone levels went up. 
Looking at semen, there were mild decreases in sperm counts, semen volume, sperm concentrations, and sperm motility with the 5 air blockers compared to placebo. There was no change in sperm morphology, though. The authors considered much of these changes relatively minor, probably without much impact on fertility. They state, quote, The impact of these compounds on fertility is unclear, especially because average sperm concentrations decreased only slightly, remaining above 20 million per milliliter in all but two subjects, one on dutasteride and one on placebo. A recent study suggested that sperm concentrations greater than 12 million per milliliter are adequate for normal fertility, unquote. The authors concluded that there were mild decreases in semen parameters that were reversible with discontinuing the drug. However, the changes were not large enough to actually affect fertility in the vast majority of cases. They did recommend that in men with low sperm counts to begin with who are taking 5 air blockers that it is worth stopping the drugs to temporarily improve fertility if they desire to be fertile. So why did this randomized trial show somewhat different results than the other one? Well. One possibility is that the study used 5 mg of finasteride a day versus the other study that used just 1 mg per day. So it's not clear that the results apply to the hair loss population that uses just 1 mg per day, which in the previous study had no effect whatsoever on sperm counts or sperm function. Now, we know that 5 mg per day is not superior to 1 mg per day when it comes to hair loss, and we also know that 5 mg per day doesn't suppress more DHT than 1 mg per day, and I talk about that in my optimal dose of finasteride video link below. Nevertheless, we are talking about five times the standard dose of finasteride that is used for the treatment of hair loss, so it is at least theoretically possible that there is some yet-to-be-found mechanistic explanation for the difference in effects on sperm parameters on 5 mg per day versus 1 mg per day. It is important to remember, though, that these effects on fertility are all very slight. Even on 5 mg of finasteride per day, it is still very, very minor. The only time that fertility would be affected would be if there were already a pre-existing fertility fertility problem to begin with. So, for the vast majority of men, fertility issues while on finasteride is of no concern whatsoever. So, let's switch from questions about fertility to questions about risk to the fetus. Is a man who uses finasteride at any risk of endangering his unborn child? Let's go ahead and find out. First of all, the package insert for finasteride says that women should not use finasteride and that women shouldn't handle crushed or broken finasteride tablets when pregnant or potentially pregnant due to the risk to a male fetus. It's worth mentioning that some women do use finasteride for hair loss and that finasteride is an effective treatment for women who have androgenic alopecia, which like in men, is the most common cause of hair loss. Finasteride is safe for women just so long as they are taking the precautions against pregnancy or if they can't get pregnant to begin with. I talk about this more in my video on the treatment of hair loss in women, which I'll link below, but the notion that women should never take finasteride is completely absurd because it is assuming that women don't know how to control their own fertility, which is incel black pill rhetoric bullshit. But to be perfectly clear, women who are pregnant or who are trying to get pregnant cannot use finasteride. The reason the tablets are coated is to prevent finasteride from being absorbed through the skin if women touch the tablets, so a woman handling the, just the tablet is probably okay to do so just so long as it isn't broken. So if you're like me and like to quarter five milligram finasteride tablets, then just make sure your partner doesn't touch them. This is the only reason why the tablets are coated at all. It's not to enhance stomach absorption or cause a slow release of the drug or anything like that. That's a pretty common misconception. There is no reduction in the efficacy of finasteride if you cut the pills, and I have a video about that which I'll link below. Anyways, the reason finasteride is bad for male fetuses is because in the uterus at least, DHT is not a trash hormone. It is actually responsible for the development of the male genitalia in the womb. In the landmark 1974 study on men in the Dominican Republic born with low DHT levels as a result of a 5-ER enzyme deficiency, it was found that the affected male babies were often mistakenly raised as girls. Fortunately for them, when puberty hit, they had normal genital development, showing that in puberty, genital development depends on testosterone levels and not DHT. However, in the uterus, DHT is an essential hormone for male genital development, so clearly women taking finasteride during pregnancy would be at risk to have male babies with abnormalities of their genitalia, and this has been shown in animal research too. For example, this rat study from way back in 1990 was done before even finasteride was approved by the FDA. At the time, it was still undergoing trials and was known by the code name of MK0906. The study found that a dose of 0.1 milligram per kilogram per day of finasteride given to female pregnant rats caused genital abnormalities in some of the baby male rats. At the extremely high dose of 100 milligrams per kilogram per day, 100% of the babies had birth defects. The researchers concluded Quote,
The risk assessment based on the induction of hypospadias indicates that the exposure of women of childbearing potential to even relatively low levels of MK0906 should be avoided, unquote. Just to explain this better, hypospadia is an abnormality of the male genitals. It was because of this very research that the warning for women of childbearing age was to avoid finasteride, and that was added to the package insert. So even though it is clear that women can't take finasteride while pregnant, the big question is, can women have sex with men who are taking finasteride. Is there enough finasteride in the semen to cause birth defects? Well, this question actually has been well researched because we have this study from 1997 done on rhesus monkeys. This is a better study than the rat study because monkeys are more closely related to humans than rats on the evolutionary tree. As a control group, the pregnant female monkeys were given oral finasteride at a dose of 2 milligrams per kilogram per day. This would be the equivalent for an average human of about 100 to 200 milligrams per day. As expected, this dose did cause genital abnormalities in the baby male monkeys. They gave the other group of monkeys intravenous doses of finasteride at doses of 8, 80, or 800 nanograms per day. These doses were more comparable to the amount of finasteride that was found to be present in human semen in men taking finasteride. In fact, the 800 nanogram dose per day was 60 times the semen levels of finasteride in men on 5 milligrams daily, and it was 750 times the semen levels of finasteride in men on 1 milligram of finasteride per day. The levels of finasteride in human semen ranges from less than 0.1 to 10.54 nanograms per milliliter of semen in men chronically on 5 milligrams daily of finasteride and from less than 0.1 to 1.52 nanograms per milliliter of semen in men on 1 milligram of finasteride per day. So the researchers determined that assuming an average ejaculate volume of 5 milliliters and assuming 100% absorption through the vagina, the highest exposure to finasteride would be less than 100 nanograms per day, and this is only if you make the very generous assumption of sexual intercourse twice per day. However, intravenous doses of up to 800 nanograms a day in these pregnant monkeys produce no birth defects at all, and like I said, these doses were up to 750 times higher than the semen finasteride levels that were seen in men taking one milligram of finasteride daily. So clearly here, even if your partner is a bigger nymphomaniac than Megan Fox and you shoot loads bigger than Peter North, you're still not going to be putting your unborn son at any risk of birth defects. And the researchers agree with me here, though they stated their conclusions in a slightly more genteel fashion. They concluded that the exposure of pregnant women through the semen of men taking finasteride was not a risk at all for the human fetus. Well, the data is reassuring for monkeys, but what about human fetuses? Are there any reports of birth defects in human babies that are related to finasteride? Well, not surprisingly, it is difficult to find any case reports of birth defects that actually are related to finasteride. So here is one that probably isn't worth mentioning, but I'll go over it anyways just to provide an example. So this case report, it is from 2009, but it is actually a report of a 41-year-old woman taking finasteride for alopecia who inadvertently took it during pregnancy. She was on one milligram per day. She delivered a baby girl with some hand and finger abnormalities. The authors felt that this was the first case report of any birth defects in humans related to finasteride. They say, quote, to our knowledge, this is the first case report of finasteride use during pregnancy in a human. It is not clear if these deformities are related to finasteride use in pregnancy, but it is worthwhile to document a possible association and focus attention on the possibility of limb deformities in such cases, unquote. Actually, I doubt this case had anything to do with finasteride at all. Development of the hand and fingers has nothing to do with DHT, and hand and finger abnormalities are common birth defects to begin with. Also, this woman was 41, which is pretty old to be having kids. We know that the incidence of birth defects increases with age, so it is possible this birth defect was related to her relatively advanced age for being the mother of a newborn. Also, this was a baby girl, and we wouldn't expect finasteride to affect female fetuses who have a low level of DHT compared to male fetuses. So, this isn't a valuable study, but I still wanted to bring it up just to show how limited and rare the research on finasteride and birth defects are to begin with. So, the next study is a little more relevant. It is from 2015 and comes from, you guessed it, Good Korea. The patients in the study came from a woman's clinic in Good Korea. There were 19 cases of pregnant women where the father had been taking finasteride when the women got pregnant. So, of these 19 women, 13 women gave birth to normal full-term babies. There were three intentional abortions and three miscarriages. You can see all the details in this table here. 
So, there were no birth defects in the babies born at full term. Clearly, the three medical abortions had nothing to do with finasteride. Among the three miscarriages, though, one woman was taking the drug diazepam, which is rated a Class D drug for pregnancy, meaning there is evidence of human fetal risk when pregnant women take the drug. So, there were no genital abnormalities or other birth defects in the babies. Whether the spontaneous abortions had anything to do with finasteride is not clear, which the authors admit. They say, quote, the rate of abortion in our data doesn't necessarily mean that finasteride is a definite cause of early pregnancy loss, unquote. Well, there's one other reassuring case report here. This case is from 2018, and it actually describes a 39-year-old woman who was taking 2.5 milligrams of finasteride daily for alopecia who got pregnant while taking the drug. The pregnancy was unplanned and happened while she was taking birth control pills, which is extremely rare. In addition, the father was also on finasteride. After discovering the pregnancy, the mother stopped finasteride, but she had taken it during the first five weeks of pregnancy. Because the couple knew that finasteride could cause birth defects, they requested an abortion, but the case was from Qatar, which has similar abortion laws to Texas, so therefore the local ethics committee refused to grant the abortion. Anyways, the couple had a full-term healthy male baby with absolutely no genital abnormalities or other birth defects. So this is a good outcome, but it is just a case report, and certainly there is a risk to the baby if a mother is taking finasteride. But there is really no evidence that the father taking finasteride can cause birth defects to the fetus. Now, the medical advice about stopping finasteride before trying to conceive is inconsistent. Some doctors say there is no need to stop finasteride, and others suggest stopping it. Some of this advice may be driven more by fear of litigation, particularly in a litigation-hungry society like the United States, rather than based on any actual science. If there is any concern about fertility and you want to play it safe, then you might consider temporarily stopping finasteride while trying to conceive with your partner. And if you're still nervous about the risk of birth defects, there is really no harm in stopping the drug temporarily. The half-life finasteride, it is very short, about five to seven hours, and so it will be out of the blood and out of the semen within just a few days or probably about a week at most. Also, the hair cycle is slow, so stopping the drug for a few months or so really won't cause you to lose any ground that you won't be able to get back and recover once you resume treatment. But generally speaking, you don't need to worry about taking finasteride if you're trying to have a baby with your partner. The only real pre caution any man has to take is making sure their partner doesn't handle broken finasteride tablets, but that's only a concern if you split your tablets like I do. If you have fertility problems, then consult with your doctor about whether or not to continue finasteride. But if you don't have fertility problems, taking finasteride won't make you infertile. That is just PFS network propaganda. If you're using finasteride, the trace amount of finasteride in your semen is not going to cause birth defects because as the research has shown, even if the amount of semen was 750 times higher than it actually is, that's still not enough to cause birth defects. So personally, I don't see any point in stopping finasteride, but if you really want to, you can stop it for a few months while you do the nasty with your partner, and then you can get back on treatment once she has the baby bump. So I hope this puts this whole issue to rest, and I'll be returning shortly with some more hair loss witchery, so stay tuned, and God bless. Thank you for watching.